Have you ever thought about what it means to be a servant? I mean, that is not the most exciting thought, is it? Today on the program, we're going to talk about the fact that you and I were shaped to serve. God has a plan for your life and for mine, and it involves serving him. Well, we're going to take a few moments and talk to some dear friends of the perspective, and they're going to talk a little bit about how their experiences in Hollywood as authors, as writers, as actors, as producers have given them an incredible opportunity to serve, and it's morphed and developed over the years. They're also going to be talking to us about a key ingredient that has given them stability in life, and that is prayer. All of that's going to be linked together with this whole thought of the fact you and I were shaped to serve. And I want you to welcome back with me uh, Squire Rushnell and Louise Duarte. We're so glad you're with us, guys, uh, all the way from Hi, Martha's Vineyard. So welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Great to be with you again. Yes. Well, and I see your place and I've been there and I'm missing it already. I wish I could have had breakfast with you guys. Uh, oh, I can still yeah. remember the jam on the scones, or is it scones? What do you guys say? Scone. Okay, jam that's wrong. The it's the other way. It's Mike. the other way, okay. Little whipped cream, little clotted cream, as they say. Mm -hmm. All right, oh, so, beautiful. you know, yeah. you guys have had such an amazing uh, career, but I don't even like the word career. God has just shaped you, and he's allowed different things to happen. Give us a glimmer of how you got involved in the whole film industry and the acting industry, um, there's so many stories we could go there, but as we're pondering the whole thing of how God shapes us, what comes to your mind right away? Well, I think we should start the adventure with my wonderful wife, <laughs> because I usually start blabbing and then she gets the short end of the shrimp. So, Well, I started my career early on. I was in my early 20s and I started working in the industry God had given me a talent. Uh, I don't think we would have called it a talent when I was a kid, but <laughs> I had the ability, because I was painfully shy, to, uh, I had the ability to impersonate people's voices. So early on, when I was in, I would say, elementary school, I could literally call up the nurse's office as my friends' mothers and get them out of school for the day. <laughs> but that started my career, believe it or not, because years later, uh, then I would take that into Hollywood and I started doing variety shows where I did characters. And, and uh, when I did one of the variety shows, a producer from Showtime saw me and put me, gave me a Showtime special. And one thing led to another and it just ended up where I eventually found myself to be through Amazing Godwin, working with the great Tim Conway and Harvey Corman on the road for 12 years, we did a wonderful show called Together Again, where they did these famous sketches from the old Carol Burnett show. And I was fortunate <laughs> enough to be part of it. I was really, I, I look at myself as the cheap version of Carol Burnett. They couldn't afford her. So <laughs> they got some, so they got someone to close, but no cigar, but it worked. So anyway, we did that for many years, and it has been such a blessing to be in this industry, but it really all started from being a shy little girl who was afraid to be herself, so she hid behind all these other voices. So that's how my career well, started. Well, yeah, and Well, and I got to interject. I got to interject. Hold on, hold on. So yeah, I'm just okay. thinking, I got this thought, Louise, that, that maybe I could take a couple of weeks off, and you could come up and imitate me. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's possible, but uh, it would be. Well, you know, I used to do... George Burns in my act. I love doing George Burns so I, so I can impersonate men too. Well, you sound a little like George Burns, right, Mike? So she could fit right in. Yeah, right. Okay. So, okay. And uh, take it from there, Squire. You, you've well, got into I'm, the God I'm known as the God Wink guy now. <laughs> yep. Uh, but I spent 20 years at ABC television and uh, another six years running a cable television network in Washington, D.C., and then various other times and places. But um, I was uh, in the broadcast business. But um, so I was probably best known in my television career when I, I ran Good Morning America, the first time we became number one. And uh, but I also had children's television under um, my directorship. And so um, 
The thing that I'm probably best known for is one of the fathers of Schoolhouse Rock. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Okay. And I said, now what's the Godwink guy? Somewhere along the way, I got fascinated with these things that people call coincidence, but don't seem like coincidence. In fact, when I went out to collect a whole bunch of those stories for a potential book, I'd interview people and they'd say, well, what do you call a coincidence that isn't a coincidence? Well, I don't know. We prayed about that. And, yeah. and before you knew it, a little word flashed into my mind and it was God wink. Hmm. Wonder what that means, I thought. Sounds like God sin, God speed, God wink. And then I started wondering, well, what would a word like God wink mean? And so what I thought about was when we were kids sitting at the big table for the first time. Remember that? You, yep. were, you were sitting there, your chin was just about up to the table, and you looked at all the people, you felt a little bit out of place, You everybody was talking and so forth, and then all of a sudden, somebody looked at you, somebody you loved, maybe it was grandma, grandpa, your mom, or your dad, and they smiled, and they gave you a little silent communication, a little wink. You didn't say, what do you mean by that? You knew. It meant, hey, kid. I'm now, you have you recorded right many of these stories. How many books do you have now? Is it 10 or 11? Ooh. We got 12. 12. We have 12, 12 okay. books. And all of these stories about God winks. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what a God wink is. It's God communicating to us through uh, supernatural means. Mm -hmm. You and each these have two minutes. Are just amazing. Two minutes. I want you to tell me your favorite story that jumps to mind. I'm going to start with uh, Miss Louise. Well, well maybe because it's a recent story, is a story about uh, Ruby, a canine officer and a dog named Ruby. It was, Ruby was in at the uh, SPCA in Providence, Rhode Island, sent back seven times because unruly, nobody wanted Ruby. So this one lovely lady named Pat Inman, who was praying that Ruby would find a home Eventually, they came to her at the SPCA and they said, we're going to put Ruby down in two hours because Ruby's unruly and had a little bit of nipping. And they said, it's a legal issue. And she said, please, she said, you can't do that. Give me 24 more hours. There's 24 more hours. I'm going to find a home for Ruby. And they said, look, this is it. Tomorrow at this time, Ruby's going down. Well, God wink. A canine officer who needed a dog walks into the SPCA and looks for a German shepherd. She said, we don't have any German shepherds, but she said, we have some very smart dogs and saw Ruby. Their eyes looked at each other and he knew, Officer Dan, that Ruby was the dog for him. Brought Ruby home, took six months, crazy time. Ruby was so unruly. Ruby eventually becomes the best canine dog in the force and a little kid's missing on a cold night. And Ruby... Oh finds the dog where all the other canine dogs could not find this kid. Ruby finds the little boy and they bring the boy to the ambulance and the commander says, the mother would like to thank you for finding her little boy. And who is the mother? But Pat Inman, the very wow. woman who saved Ruby's life. And Do Officer Dan said, that means that the dog you saved saved your son's life and that beautiful. story is a hundred percent true yeah and that's the way it went on the screen at netflix and i probably messed it up because i said it so so well, you fast did it, dude. you but, did it well but i've seen yeah. the movie it's fantastic i mean it choked me up with emotion as well it was just an incredible movie uh how many views <laughs> did it have on netflix like 50 it 60 had million 100 million views in its first 365 yes. days Okay. Unbelievable. Squire, yeah. tell me one of your favorite Godwink stories. Well, I think one of the one of the best is about uh, Diane Lane, the famous actress. Uh, Diane Lane was sitting in the back of a cab in Manhattan, uh, watching all of those yellow cabs going this way and that way. And it brought her back to her dad, who had recently graduated to heaven. And, and she was feeling so sad because she was going to a TV show, which was his favorite TV show to watch. And uh, she was out promoting a movie and, and she's thinking uh, in this melancholy fashion about her dad. And when she was a little girl, he drove a taxi 
6F59. 6F59. That was the number. She always remembered when the cab would come to pick her up after school and he would take her like a, a, like a princess in a chariot wherever she needed to go. Well, she, she thought, oh, I just wish my dad were with me today. The car that she was in pulled to the curb. She gets out and her heart leapt because pulling in right ahead of her was cab number 6F59. Her dad's old medallion, the old cab that he drove, was pulling in out of all the thousands of cabs in New York at that place at that moment. And that was the divine alignment. God divinely aligned that cab to be there, not five minutes sooner, not even a minute later, but just at that moment for the God wink to take place. And that's how God winks at you. That is so powerful. Folks, I want you to stay with us. We're going to be right back to talk about an even important connection with Squire and Louise. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rachel Joy Barbeau, founder of I'mChangingTheNarrative.org. Check it out, I'mChangingTheNarrative.org. Also former national sportscaster, and I've got a book coming out I'll tell you about in just a moment. But I want to invite you to, to um, recognize the people in your life. Are you ready for this? that spoke to you like a winner before you were even winning. Woo, boy, the people that recognize the winner in you before you were outwardly winning. What if today you sent those people a, a message, a text, a card, hired a skywriter, just kidding on the last part, but if you let them know, hey, thank you for speaking to the winner in me and seeing something in me when I didn't even love myself or I didn't feel like I was winning. And maybe conversely, because somebody did it for you, you could find people in your life, in your workspace, in your church, in your home that you could speak to like a winner, even though they aren't winning at this very minute. I'm telling you, it'll revolutionize your life and somebody else's life. And if you love to read, make sure you pick up a copy of Relentless Joy. Uh, Pre-orders matter and you can grab it wherever books are sold. I would absolutely love if you would grab a copy and would love to hear from you and see how the book affected your life. I'm back here with Squire and Louise, and those were powerful, powerful stories as we see how God intersects. Life doesn't happen by chance. You have encouraged me and hundreds of thousands of other people with the fact that you not only talk about prayer, but how you practice prayer as a couple. I want you to tell us about that in a moment, but I just want to say that last week on our program, we had Ryan and Jennifer Walter. Ryan uh, is an NHL uh, superstar, and they were all on the program about a year ago, less than maybe 10 months ago, the four of you, and you shared a practice that you guys have every day and it's been transformational for them. And they referenced that uh, last yeah. week. Talk to me about what that is. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the coffee service early in the morning, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, that thrills us that another couple is praying together. Yes. And that is exactly what happens when uh, we, when you come to the Yellow Cottage on Martha's Vineyard, as <laughs> uh, you and Terry have done, Mike, uh, you know that uh, one of our routines is that our routines is to um, to have a board meeting with the CEO every single morning. I bring my wife a little tray and we have a bagel and we have coffee and we have prayer mm -hmm. together. We pray together. And we have advocated now for uh, probably about 17 years to uh, encourage couples, particularly couples, I mean, it can work with everybody, but particularly couples to pray together five minutes a day for 40 days. We dare you to try it. We oh. just dare you to try it. And, and the amazing thing that happens is that whatever kind of a marriage you have, if your marriage is on the rocks, you'll be walked back, you walk yourself back from that, from that cliff. 
if you've got a great marriage, it will become a fabulous mm -hmm. marriage. And, and partnered prayer is so amazing. You'd think that we had maybe come up with the idea ourselves. We did not. We are ripping off a guy named Jesus Christ. He writes about it in the Bible, <laughs> where two of you agree on anything. My Father in heaven will give it to you and other places in the Bible. And so partnered prayer sounds like a new idea to a lot of churches that we go to, where it just, you know, people kind of forget about it. You know, it's, it's the idea of praying together is not promoted in our institutions. Okay, I got a bunch of questions. I want to jump in. Louise, I want yeah. you to answer why 40 days and how has partner prayer impacted you? Well, 40 days because, you know, a habit starts taking place after so many days. And also you start seeing the cause and effect. So when you look back, you know, we live our lives forward, but we really understand <laughs> it backwards. So when we look back, we can see how in our prayer time, how, how God has answered those prayers as only he can do and you know when squire and i started praying we i mean it was really right after we we got together mm -hmm. but we Mary. were surprised mm -hmm. i have to tell you mike that more churches weren't encouraging that i mean churches pray they pray with the congregation they have prayer circles they have men's bible study women's bible study bible studies in general but that intimate act, we wrote a book called Couples Who Pray, The Most Intimate Act Between a Man and a Woman, because it really is. And, and when we get uh, to that point where we pray with our spouse, so often women will say, when I prayed with my husband, mm. I saw the heart of my husband, which was yeah. so important. And the husband felt so protective of his wife, and she felt protected as he prayed over her. So it's a win-win situation. And after the 40 days because we're doing this with Baylor University. Remember, Baylor University, the study of religion. This is Baylor University is doing the first empirical study of what happens when couples pray for an extended period of time, five minutes a day. We have some preliminary stats that will blow your mind. But one of the things that blew my mind the most was the fear of divorce goes to zero when couples yeah. pray together. Yeah, and wow. appreciation and things like that go up by 20 to 30%. Romance goes up over 20%. Listen, guys, that's very important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how is this all developing? You have a pray, stay challenge. Talk to us about what that is. Well, you know, we've been going around uh, America and Canada for maybe the last 15 years, encouraging churches to do the 40-day challenge. And by the way, yeah. when they do, yeah. the results have been so astronomical. So this is good, but it's just mom and pop. So it was hard yeah. to go to every church. So be, and because we're television producers and movie producers, Squire had an idea. Yeah, we said, why don't we just, we need to have an event something that will happen at the same time where all the churches in America and Canada and elsewhere and all the families can come together at that event. And that would be a weekly television show, Pray, Stay Challenge, where we follow six couples for six weeks. And then we do another cycle, another cycle, another cycle. Each family, each couple has, a, has issues that they have to deal with. But we say, imagine what God can do when you give him five minutes a day, the amount of time it takes to drink your cup of coffee, could you give God that amount of time together every day? I know you're busy. We know that you've got busy schedules. You're going here, there. Sometimes you'll pray in the back of a cab or sometimes over the phone or text. But if people who pray together, they find the results are astounding. Mm. And so this television series, we are planning for this to launch in 2024. We're getting very, very close on nailing down the distribution. That's always the key. Mm -hmm. Who's going to carry this show? Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of partners that are very impressive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll tell you all about it soon. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited to hear that. And I don't know if I told you this, but we're planning to do it in the church that I pastor. So uh, somehow I'm going to uh, come down and put you guys in a car, get you on a plane and get you up here to launch it for us. Uh, that would be just fantastic. 
Uh, oh, love we, always, it. we always love to come to Canada. <laughs> There's, yeah, we want you to come in the dead of winter, okay, just to really appreciate the north. It's all right. I okay. grew up right near the Thousand Island Bridge. I, it was right. a, I grew up in a refrigerator. Yeah. I'm actually 10 years older than I look. They thawed me out. Well, we're going to pray about that one for you, okay? So we'll just leave it at that. Give me some examples of how marriages have been changed uh, when couples yes. have prayed. You've said that in general. Is there one or two specific things that come to mind? I'm going to ask Louise to jump in first and okay. then pass the baton. Well, well, one of the things we noticed, we were invited to go to Church of the Highlands. It was in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And they had done the 40-day prayer challenge. And with couples who pray, we have the study guide and everything. And so they invited us to a, a group of 70 people they were mostly couples. Yeah, so it was about 35 couples, yeah. And they had us sit on stools and they said, okay, now tell Squire and Louise what happened after the 40 days. Well, the two of us just wept. I mean, marriages were yeah. saved. Uh, conflicts, mm -hmm. you know, they came together. But the thing that touched us the most, what the couple said that their children saw a noticeable difference in our countenance. They, A kid would say, mom, Dad, how come you're laughing all the time now? Or, or, or what Mom, happened to yeah, you? Yeah, you seem happy. <laughs> you know, the kids were actually noticing. And, you know, we had talked to, not to name drop, Denzel Washington's wife, Pauletta, and she became involved with us in the Couples Who Pray mm -hmm. book because she heard what we were doing and she said, that influenced her life as a child when she saw her parents praying. So when she went into a marriage with Denzel and they started praying and their children saw them praying, she said she wanted to continue that legacy. And, and they've been married, I guess, over 35 years in Hollywood. That's you know a miracle. But I think what we have been seeing is that not only does it help the couple in communication, but it, it's the foundation for the entire family. And if the family's foundation is strong, then the country will be strong. Yes. You know, we can change the world, really, one prayer at a time when you think about it. I love that. Squire, we got about a minute left. Give us an example. How do you start to pray? What is it you say? What do you ask God for? Is it just like a Christmas list? You know, I, I I start every single day thanking God for yeah, what He incredible. has already done since yesterday. Yes, and it's absolutely amazing that you can actually kind of remember what happened yesterday, <laughs> no matter Easy how old for you, you to are. Say. <laughs> but but we we just we absolutely count the answered prayers. Yeah. And by the way, every answered prayer is a God wink. That's true. Okay, that's in the dictionary. But um, but what happens is, is that when we talk to God all the time, the more we talk to him, the, the better he has, the better the relationship we have. But that happens in our whole life. You know, mm -hmm. when you talk to your parents on a regular basis, you have a better relationship. Mm -hmm. When you talk to your boss on a regular basis, you have a better relationship. Talk to God frequently and you have a better relationship. Five minutes a day mm -hmm. is all that you need to do. And you will find that it is transformative but it's a in con your job. life. But it is a con job. Well, it is a con job in the sense that <laughs> that at the end of 40 days that you're going to quit. And it's you're usually more than five minutes. Why would you stop? <laughs> and yeah, that's true. And you, there you, you go. Well, it's a minimum of five A minutes. minimum, yes. A minimum of but five But it minutes. always ends up being longer <laughs> and more fulfilling. It's well, true. it is. Hey, I love you guys. <laughs> Thank you for encouraging me, our viewers. And I just, with you, we just want to encourage all of you watching today to start to take five minutes and just invite the creator of the universe, the Lord himself, into the midst of your situation. Squire and Louise, I love you guys. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Love Thanks, you, Mike. Bye-bye. remember 10 to 12 years ago, there was a series of books came out that are still popular today, and it was called the Dummy Series. There was uh, bird watching for dummies. There was computers for dummies. There was woodworking for dummies. There was, I think, parenting for dummies. But never did I see one that was called serving 
for dummies. Matter of fact, a little play on words, people would often think that you'd be a dummy if you wanted to serve. And really goes against the grain of what Jesus talked about. Jesus talked about being the servant. He said the one who is greatest of all needs to be the servant of all. And as we're working through the purpose-driven life, do you realize this incredible truth that God has put you on earth to make a contribution? He wants you to make a difference with the life that he has given to you. You know, there are many other books that tell you in life how to get more out of life. And yet God has designed you and I differently. Could it be possible today that you are living for the wrong reasons? If you think that living just for yourself is what's going to fill you up, you know it that at the end of the day, it leaves you empty. Just look at the tabloids when you check out at the supermarket, all the different glossy pictures of all the famous people. We see the ups and downs of their life. And maybe one of the reasons we are drawn into their stories is because often they mirror what is happening in our own life. We often wonder if I had the money of this person or the fame of that person, what would it be like? And then we see another few months later or a year later how they've crashed and burned. Is that any different than your life or mine? It doesn't have to be the same. It can be different. But we need to realize that we've been put on light on this earth to make a contribution. As we think through our purpose in life, let me read to you from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10. Here it is. It says, It was God himself who made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ago he planned that we should spend our lives, you ready for this, in helping others. He planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. All right, here's a question. Here's a question that I want us to think about because I believe that it is life-changing. And the question is this, does your life revolve around yourself or is it in doing what God created you for? Now, when we say it like that, it almost seems like the one way is a life filled with fun and excitement. And and then to to follow after God, oh my goodness, that's going to be drudgery and boring and so restrictive. Discover that it's anything but that. Matter of fact, it's more than than the other way. It's far better than the other way. Jesus actually said, you can't serve two masters. And maybe part of the conflict in your life is because the Spirit of God has been tugging at you to say, I want you to go down this direction. But you say, no, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there at all. We think of what Squire and Louise were sharing about their many God-wink stories. And how many times do we see God-wink? Do we see those divine coincidence, that divine alignment, when we are saying, God, I want to surrender to you. I want to trust you completely. A number of years ago, I saw a picture of a man in downtown Los Angeles. He was wearing one of those A-frame signs, you know, the sign on the one side of him and then on the other. And on the front, it said, I'm a fool for Christ. On the back, it read, whose fool are you? Hmm. He was quoting from the Apostle Paul who said, you know, the world looks at us as if we're foolish because we're following after Christ. But who is it that you are following after today? And that's why as we ponder that, we come to uh, a principle in Scripture that is somewhat unnerving because it goes against the secular grain. It goes against the, the general feeling of humanity. And it's this, the you and I were saved from our sins to serve God. We've been bought with the price that Christ has paid for us and given a divine purpose, a divine commission. And it's called serving him. I want to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, and listen to the words that Paul wrote from prison to the person, the young man who was his helper, Timothy. It says, it is he, referring to Jesus, who saved us and chose us for his holy work. Not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan. You and I were saved to serve God. 
Have you ever noticed that when a young couple has their first baby, their first child, and sometimes maybe even the second, but when they have the first one, if you're a dad like me, I wanted bragging rights. I wanted our little daughter to say my name first, Dada. And I would, you know, rehearse that with her until, you know, oftentimes it was the first word that she said. And I could pat myself on the back and say, look, she's calling out to me. <clears throat> but the problem was this. In the middle of the night, that would be the word that she would say, Dada, Dada. And I realized it's probably better for my sanity if I want to get a good night's sleep that she learned to say, you know, Mama or Mommy first and cry out for the mother. And I say, well, Terry, you got to go take care of her. You got to go serve her. In our spiritual journey, I want you to understand what needs to be our first words. Because when we have an encounter with Christ, we need to be open saying, a real encounter is going to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Matter of fact, that's what happened to the man that we refer to as the Apostle Paul. In the book of Acts chapter 9, he's on a road to Damascus. And he's going down that road to imprison Christians, to put them in jail. And while he's going down the road, he has this divine encounter. There's a great light from heaven. There's a voice. And he falls to his knees and he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? And that's a life game. That's a life changer. That's a game changer. And I find that as spiritually young people, when we come to faith in Christ, our first words need to be, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with the life you've entrusted to me? It means we're listening to a different commander. I'm not in charge anymore. I'm saying, Jesus, I want you to take the wheel of my life. And that needs to be the first words that I utter to the Lord. We listened to Squire and Louise. They were talking about prayer. And in essence, that's what's happening every morning in their journey. As they take time to pray and thank God for the day before and the opportunities in front of them to say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to be sensitive to how you're going to lead and guide and direct me? Because here's the kicker. As we unpack the purpose for which God has created us, we discover it's in serving our Lord that we find significance. Many times we're concerned, what will people think of me and what I'm doing? But I need to be more concerned of what does God think about what I am doing? There's a very uh, descriptive picture in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Jeremiah. And I want you to listen as I read to you some of the scripture, because while it's not going to come up on the screen, it's found in Jeremiah chapter 18. And the story of Jeremiah, he's the prophet, he goes down to the potter. And there's going to be a lesson that he has taught. Let's listen together. It said, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I'll let you hear my words. So I went to the potter's house, and he was working at the wheel, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. And then we read these words, the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Why did I read that story? I remember a number of years ago, I was teaching from this passage, and I actually invited a potter to come in while I was speaking. <clears throat> and he had the table that would be spinning round and round, and he would take a lump of clay. And as it was spinning and he kept putting the water over the clay to keep it soft, he would push in with his thumbs. He would push with his fingers and the clay would take various shapes. Now, if I was a piece of clay, I'd say, wow, hey man, that hurts. You know, lay off, back off. And then if the clay was just wasn't working right, he'd pick it all up, he'd mush it together, he'd slam it down and start all over again. And he would create it into the beautiful shape that was in his mind. He was an artist and he knew what he wanted to do. There are some principles from the story in Jeremiah. And the reason Jeremiah is given this incredible picture is because the nation of Israel were going to come under the judgment of God. 
and he was going to tell them that judgment is coming if we do not repent. I firmly believe that God's judgment is on the world if we do not repent. It's still the same today. But in the midst of that, God is looking for men and women of all ages, stripes, colors, ethnicities, backgrounds. It doesn't matter. He's looking for men and women who will be open to him and saying, Lord, how do you want me to serve you? How do you want me to follow you? And God is saying from this picture to you and to me, he says, if you're willing to be willing, you're like that lump of clay. And I want to move you and shape you so that whatever it is you're going through, you can use that as a way of declaring my glory. Well, you know, we all want to be that beautiful vase. But what happens when the potter pushes in and it hurts? What happens when there's a lot of pressure exerted? Maybe you're feeling that in your life right now. Maybe you're saying, God, it's just more than I can handle. It's more than, than I really know about. I just don't think I can cope. And he's saying, will you trust me? I'm the potter and you're the clay. And in the midst of all this, we learn something about God. As we choose to trust him, we also discover that he is sovereign. He is in control. And in Romans chapter 9 and verse 20, Paul writes about it. He says, but who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed him? Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Now, folks, as a pastor, I've worked with people for over 40 years. I've heard all sorts of stories. I've heard a lot of painful stories. I've heard people say, I don't know why God allowed me to go through this. And there are times I don't have the answer, but I do know that we have a choice. We can trust him or we cannot trust him. And when I choose to trust, I discover that God lifts the weight off of me. I've experienced that personally as I've gone through some health issues. Uh, my goodness, you're raising five children. There's all sorts of issues that can be there. Uh, there has been moves. There have been all sorts of uh, experiences that we've had in working with churches across the country. And it'd be so easy to just say, I'm done with it all. But when you come to that point, what are you left with? What are you left with? I talked to a man just the other day who was angry at everybody for all that had happened, including God. He didn't know why it had happened. And as we talked more and more, I said to him, at the end of the day, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to turn to? And he was feeling a bit like the clay, even though we didn't use that illustration, that he was just being pushed and it was hard. It was painful. But we come back to this and we see God is sovereign. He's working out a plan. He says, will you trust me with your life? Will you allow me to shape you into the, pay, into the person that I want you to be. And so we see that through all of this, what God was saying through Jeremiah when he went to the potter, he said, I am also gracious and patient. I'm patient with the nation of Israel. They've been doing their own thing. They've been stubborn. They've been resistant to me, but I'm patient. But there is a time of judgment. There's going to be a time of accountability coming. And so he talks about taking the clay and reworking it and throwing it down on the potter's wheel and then reshaping it again. And sometimes what happens in our life is we discover that when we come to wit's end corner, we come to that brick wall that we just can't do anything. We say, okay, God, I surrender. God wants us to come to that point saying, trust me. Don't be mad and defiant against me, but saying, Lord, here I am. Is it difficult in those moments? Yes. You feel sometimes like the air has been sucked out of you? Absolutely. Almost every day I read on my phone some of the prayer requests that come into the church that I pastor. Some of the needs, the many needs that people have. We have a food bank that serves thousands of people. And they have the opportunity to write in and to share their prayer requests. And some of those requests are just heartbreaking. But I do know this, we have a God who cares for them. And he calls for the church to gather around them, to support, to encourage people. But that only happens as people are saying, Lord, I'll be willing to serve. I'll be willing to help. I watched that happen just the other day. As a couple came, there was a daughter. I suppose she was in her 30s and the father was maybe 60-ish. He was in a wheelchair and they didn't have much. And she pushed her dad in the wheelchair over five kilometers just to come to our church to get food. 
And then they insisted that they'd be able to carry the food back that was piled on the wheelchair, even though there was offers given to help them. But what really intrigued me as I talked to them for a moment, and then I was standing back, is that some of the people from our food bank just came up and gathered around them on their own. And they said, can we pray for you? We've given you things and we want to help you, but we want to give you something greater is what they were saying. We want to pray for you. And as I watched them minister and care for that father and daughter, my heart was just filled with gratitude for the way God had been shaping them, that they could step up and serve and make such a difference and make such an impact in those people's lives who felt we had nothing. People have forsaken us. Nobody cares. But that's not true. Have you thought about what it means for you to be a servant? of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Could it be that God has shaped you for serving? Well, I'm gonna tell you this, he has, but he's looking for willing people. He's not gonna force that on you. And as my wife and I look back over our years of ministry, I'm so grateful that God didn't give up on me. So there were some days I just wanna say, God, you know, just, just get rid of all these people. They're a pain in the butt. And he kind of whispered to me, he said, Michael, don't you think you've been that way yourself as well? And then I realized, Lord, what a privilege I have to serve you, the King of Kings. It doesn't matter whether I get recognition or not, but the fact that I'm doing it for you, that's what it's all about. And it's even better when no one knows about it. And I think of the ministries in our church and other churches that I've led as I've watched things happen around the world and see the hand of God moving through people. I see it in war-torn countries right now where people are selflessly stepping up and saying, We want to help. We want to care for people. And we see the love of Christ in action. Do you want to serve? You need to know your shape. Hey, folks, let me tell you, nothing needs to be beneath our dignity. From taking out the trash to standing up and speaking in front of a camera. When I leave here today after recording this program, I'm going to go home and I get to do dishes with my wife or I get to serve in a practical way in our church. And guess what my job is? One of my specialties is taking out the garbage. It doesn't have to be beneath me or beneath you. But here's the deal. There are many things that have to be done in in ministry. There are many things that are done in the life of the church, many things in the community, and I'm not good at them. You know, I'm not really that very good at, at technical things. And my mind is just not wired for that. Uh, I can use a computer and stuff like that, but to get into the back end of it and make it all work. And I look at the technicians uh, who help us in our church, people that volunteer their time. And I'm just amazed. I'm so thankful because it's like a team working together. I see people creating meals for uh, the many homeless people that we serve. And they just show up and they take this food safe course and they're creating sandwiches, they're making soup and they're caring for people. I watch people in our food bank and they administrate that whole thing. They just basically say, Mike, stay away because you're going to mess it all up. And they got a network of almost 100 volunteers who just are buying the food, they're packing the food, they're delivering the food. And I sit back and I say, God, this is your church in action. And it's a beautiful thing. I think of one story where it was a doctor and he had a very busy schedule. I think he was a neurosurgeon. And he said, I'm not free at a lot of times to do things, but here's one thing that I can do because I want to be actively serving. He said, I can be a parking attendant at our church. And on certain days, I can be there to direct the traffic and greet and welcome the people. How cool is that? He has his giftings. He's a surgeon. He's doing everything else. But he said, I want to step up and I want to serve. So take your abilities and apply them. You know, in Exodus chapter 31, verses 3 to 5, they're talking about building the tabernacle, which was ornate. It was beautiful. It says, The artists and craftsmen were shaped with the skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts to make artistic designs and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Now, folks, that wouldn't have been my calling. I'd be there with a two-by-four, and I can cut a 45-degree angle and nail it together. But don't ask me to make some ornate uh, carving. God said, I want that for the temple. And there's people who I've given an ability to to do it. So step up. This is your opportunity. You need to apply your ability to what you can do. I need to do what I've been equipped to do. And you need to do what you've been equipped to do. 
and use your personality. Oh my goodness, it says in Romans 12 verse five, since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. Now, not everyone has my sense of humor, and you're probably pretty glad for that, but you need to use your unique personality, who you are. Maybe you got a difficult task in front of you, and you just got the ability to persevere. And in doing that, you're bringing other people along, and they're being blessed. Use your personality, the charm, the beauty, the winsomeness that Christ has given to you as you care and as you uh, love on people. And then draw from your experiences. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So much we could say about this, but in a nutshell, it is this. The things that you have gone through, God is saying to you, Will you allow me to take those things and use them as a way of comforting other people? Maybe you've experienced a loss. You know what it's like. And you can go and sit with that person who is grieving and listen to them. Maybe you've gone through a divorce and you know how dark it was. And you see someone else going through it and you're able to go to them and say, listen, here's what you need to watch out for. But I want you to know there's light at the end of the tunnel. Or maybe there's been financial ruin and that person is just overwhelmed. You say, you know, I've been at that point. I've been when there's been nothing and didn't know how to pay the bills. But I want to encourage you. You can press on. Draw from the things that you go through because here is an amazing truth. Satisfaction. And everybody wants to be satisfied. We want to live a life that counts. But satisfaction comes when you discover your unique shape and where you are to serve. So if you're just sitting there on the couch, it's time to get up. Time to say, in some way, I want to serve. Case in point, as we wrap up today, I heard a great story uh, out of our food bank. They go downtown to feed the homeless. And there's a man who comes to our church. His name is Gord. And he goes in his wheelchair. He drives about five kilometers in his motorized wheelchair to serve the people. How does he do it? Well, he takes sandwiches and bananas in the little basket in front of his motorized cart and he drives a couple blocks around where our tables are set up to serve people, and he hands those out to the people who are not able to come. How cool is that? He's just saying, this is what I have. God, I want to serve you. And if he can do it, you can do it. But in doing that, guess what? We need to do it with the motive that Christ has called me to serve, and as I respond in obedience to him, oh my goodness, the joy that you will experience, that you will find, when you follow the nudge of God's Spirit in your life. That's what Jerry Ponson was saying to his friend, Mac. They were trying to survive in the stormy water. He never thought he'd be in a mess like this. They had shoved off at 5 a.m., Mac and him and the dog, Booga. It was about three miles across the bay to their favorite duck hunting spot, but they got halfway across. A nor'easter came down the channel and it picked up their boat and tossed it like a toy. The boat sank. They grabbed their stick, it was the pole, the only thing they had. They jammed it into the mud, and Jerry was holding on to the pole, and he was holding on to Mac with his other hand. Mac was older and, and was weaker. I can't hold on anymore, Jerry. Hold on, Mac, somebody will come. Where's my dog, Booga? I told the dog to leave because, well, he knew the dog would never make it to shore. It was three miles. He even thought of leaving Mac and swimming to shore, but then it was another five miles to a telephone. Now they had no choice. They had to just stay here and just hope against hope that a boat would come down the channel. Hold on, Mac. 
Somebody will come. He didn't really believe that. He didn't believe it at all. He didn't believe that the dog would get to shore and he didn't believe that a boat would come down the channel because he didn't believe in anything. He remembered the time that his sister told him about God and he called her a fruitcake, kicked her out of the house. Smash, a big wave just washed over them. He thought, maybe I better try to talk to God. He said, God, send a boat, God, please. Give me a second chance, God, send a boat. It wasn't two minutes later. He looked up and through the mist, he saw a cross. He blinked. No, wait, it wasn't a cross. It was the mast of a boat. He took off his shirt. He tied it to the pole. Still trying to hold on to Mac, he's waving the pole in the air. He's thinking, this is ridiculous. They're never going to find us out here. They're never going to see us out here in the water where we're not supposed to be. But they did see him. Pretty soon, a little boat was coming from the big boat. They pulled him on board. And when Jerry climbed aboard that big boat, he had the biggest God wink of his life. The name of the boat was Second Chance. And when they got to shore, there was Booga the dog waiting for them. Franklin was a new pilot flying a small plane from Florida to Texas, back to college. He knew his parents were very worried. In fact, they were praying fervently that he would get there safely. To ease their anxiety, he even brought his instructor along to fly with him. They were south of Jackson, Mississippi at the time that the sun was going down. Meanwhile, at the little airport in Jackson, Mississippi, a man named Sidney was wrapping things up. He had already closed down the exterior lights, and in fact, he was giving an after-hours tour of the control tower to some folks from church. He picked up a light gun, and he pointed it out the window. He said, this is a light that we shine on a plane that is in distress. When they see this green light, they know it's safe to land. He put that down. Meanwhile, up in the air, Franklin was suddenly in trouble. All of a sudden, the lights all went out inside the plane. He lost all electrical power. The radio was out. The instrument panel was out. He didn't know where he was and where he was going. He brought it down below the clouds and suddenly there was a city there. He looked and looked to see if he could find a place to land. And then he saw a green light. He said, look, there's a light for planes in distress. He started heading toward that light. Meanwhile, down in the airport, Sidney was continuing with his tour. He was just getting to the part where he threw the lever to turn on the outside runway lights. And all of the lights outside burst into bright, bright lights against the dark night. He said, this is the runway lights, and this is how I turn them off. And he turned them off. Meanwhile, up in the plane, Franklin was heading toward that green light. He, he didn't know where it was taking him, but suddenly the lights burst on and a runway was showing beneath him and he came in for a landing. As he was heading toward the hangar, the lights went out. The instructor said, you'd think they could have waited until we got to the hangar. Well, he was a little bit annoyed, but Sidney was a little bit surprised when somebody said, hey, Sidney, a plane just landed. What? He wasn't nearly as surprised as when he found out who was walking through the door. Franklin Graham, the son of the famous preacher Billy Graham. Billy Graham had been praying and praying for his safe arrival. And you can see how this incredible Godwin shows that long distance prayers really work because Franklin Graham landed safely.
As we conclude today, I want to make available to you a book that I've offered before. It's called Emotionally Free. A Prescription for Healing Body, Soul, and Spirit is written by my good friend, Dr. Grant Mullen, who has been on our program many times. If you write to me, prayer at the perspective.tv, and request a copy of Emotionally Free. If you've ever gone through a dark time, a discouraging time, and wondering how to get through it, Emotionally Free is an incredible guidebook for people who have struggled with depression, discouragement, and anything related to emotional and mental illness. Well, I want to encourage you to get this book. Write to me at prayeratheperspective.tv. We're making it available to you today. It's a $30 gift. We're making it available just for writing. And when you write, would you let us know that you've watched the program, you've been enjoying it? Maybe something, a subject you'd like us to talk about. We would love to hear from you. But more than anything else, we want you to know what it means to know Jesus. And as I often do at the end of each program, can I invite you today just to open up your heart to the Savior and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm asking you to be my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. And if you pray that prayer, that's the starting point. Let me know. I'll send you more material to encourage you in your spiritual life. Know that God loves you. He cares for you. And until next time, may his peace reign in your heart.